we have uh, two lectures, because Mirko is still away. And uh, I will try to print the papers for uh, tomorrow in the, in the lunch break. I haven't had time to do it yet. Um, and uh, the, so far we basically talked about how to do a sequence alignment, so how to find the optimal alignment between two, two sequences. So that was last week. And then yesterday we talked about two things. One is faster, so called juristic methods, that are not guaranteed to find optimal alignment, that, that but can do this sort of alignment, or at least the score of alignment, much faster. And we also talked about the statistics of the alignment. So like, what is um, uh, what is the uh, likelihood or the probability that you find such an alignment by random? So how, how likely is it that you find well, how likely is it that it's not the random sequence? How likely is it that it actually is something that is homologous? So, so today we're going to continue because. I mean, so far we talked about alignment of two sequences, but actually you could think about doing alignment of more than two sequences, three or four or ten thousand. And uh, so this is called multiple sequence alignments. So that's one part of it is basically talking about how some different strategies to do multiple sequence alignments. We don't idea, idea that. But what is probably more important, almost more important, is actually how you use it. What, what kind of extra information can you get from this? And this is like, you can find patterns, you can find so-called profiles, or you can also make hidden marker models. So I'll talk a bit about all these things, three things. So this is really when biomathics, this is also fundamental biomathics things. If, if you have two sequences that you compare to each other, you can, you can see something. You can see what, what is concerned, what is not concerned, you can look at different things. But if you have a whole family of sequences together, you can see some regions are conserved, some regions are not conserved. You can see body variabilities. And this is really, really useful for, for predicting and identifying features of the whole protein family. Unfortunately, to obtain multiple sequence alignment is non-trivial. Actually, it's proven to be and be hard, which means that it's basically computationally impossible for more than if you have more than three or four or five sequences. And, because uh, it's, um, uh, <coughs> you have basically two to the power of n minus one alternatives of al alignments. So it's, it gets, even for small n, it gets very, very big. You have ten, so like thousand alternatives, but for twenty, it's million. So it gets very, very complicated. So you really find optimal alignment is basically possible. It takes very long time. So often you end, end up using, you, but you always end up some heuristic methods. So there are a number of these methods. Cluster W was for a long time the most popular method. It was probably not the best method, but it was kind of a good compromise between speed and accuracy. k align is uh, another good compromise. It was developed here in Stockholm by the Sonheimer group. t coffee and a number of methods. One problem with this is that they, they always, all of them have a kind of a tendency that Nowadays, when you have extremely big families, when you have families that contain got, got tens of thousands of sequences, they can't really handle it. These are okay methods if you use maybe 10 or 100 sequences often. But for these really, really big families, they are not very useful. And uh, there are these examples that could cluster Omega, which is a good version of it. But even side loss or variations of side loss, which are not really multiple sequence alignment methods, but they are actually more iterative sequence alignment methods, are getting more and more useful. But uh, we'll just talk a bit about the general ideas of what, what, what the problems are. So one problem is actually is scoring. So if you have an alignment, just look at one position here. So you have alignment of uh, six sequences. So you have one column here. You can think about a multiple sequence alignment. So you have, of course, it is given an alignment even in ignoring g gaps. You can think about that you have, this is a column. So somehow, these three positions are, uh, not thinking about how we get it, but just if you have it, you should have some scores here. So if somehow you have substitution 
substitute C with S, and then you have substitute S with C, and then uh, maybe C with C again. So that uh, how should you calculate it? I mean, is there some order? So at least there are three different ideas. One is actually you have some kind of tree here. So you kind of have like you count, you say, okay, these two C's are most similar in the beginning, so you only have one change from C to S. So you have here like A changes to B, and then B changes to C and D, and then C changes to E and F. So you kind of have a hierarchical. And you take a score here, which is a score of substitution A to B, and B to C, and C to D. You can have one that you start from, you can start from the top one, and then you just take C to S and C to C. So you take a score like that, like a star. Or you can take all combination of everything together. This is often the most common way, because you don't really know where you start, and you want to make no, nobody says that this one is more important than that one. But uh, it's not a, this uh, even for these six. I mean, uh, six sequences, you get a long score here. So this is something you have to decide. So even and then you have to think about gaps. If it's complicated thing, more 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 further. So if you have a gap here, do you count this as one gap, or maybe you have a gap there, and in another position you have two gaps? So how do you do the, deal with that? And then if you have a gap opening penalty, if you have a gap like if you have a gap like that, so it has something here before. So you have a gap here. So here is this a gap extension or is it a because it, or because it's not gap there? So like there are, there are a number of ideas you have to think about how to deal with first. That they're complicated. So like how how is this gap treated? Is it the second gap or is it the first gap? Or, or I mean, if you have you can even think about how something like this. Gaps like that. So is this the extension or is a new gap? And how do you deal with it? So it's, it's not, it's not, it's not, it's not it's just phases, it's not a trivial problem. In general, the idea what you do is basically some kind of, kind of progressive multiple sequence environments. So you start with maybe doing, oh, sorry, not this one, uh, with doing all the pairwise alignments. And you start aligning maybe the two most, so you make some kind of distance matrix, so you can make a tree, this is what we'll talk about tomorrow, I think. So you have a tree, so you take this one closest to each other, and then these are quite close, and then this one is closer to that one. And so. so you start with aligning these two together, and then you start aligning these two together, and then you add uh, three and one together, so you add it together, you see three together, and then you add everything together again. So then you need, so you don't really try all. So once you align these two together, you don't change the alignment between them. So if you introduce a gap in one of them, you introduce a gap in both of them. So, but it, this of course is not. Uh, I mean, it's not obvious in like a case like this. Of course, if I start aligning these two, maybe I get this alignment here. But then, if actually, if I wanted to, maybe I should actually have this one probably should have been over there. I have another gap later because it's not. I mean, it depends on the order I do things in this case. Well, you start with things most close to each other, but if that's equally close or if there are similarities, it's not obvious to do the same answer every time. But anyway, this is what class of W does. Because class of W is historically the most used method. There are better methods, but uh, it's, it's not a bad. So the first idea is basically, so it was developed in the late 80s. So from, from, from the word cluster, it does a clustering. So basically, and it gets a guide to it. Basically, it basically calculates the distance between every pair of sequences. So it does a start with doing all pairwise alignments. So that of course takes some time. But for 100 sequences, it's maybe doable because you can do a million, no, 10,000 alignments. For 1,000 sequences, it's getting a bit expensive, but you can maybe still do it. Uh, but at least that, so we basically find how each sequence is related to each other. So then, from this guide tree, or this clustering, you get you make a tree. So basically, you try to adjust three. Let's say these are these are close to each other, and these are further, this is a further away. So basically, clustering together. So here you have the so first you align, so you have to think about four sequences. These two are closest together, and these are close to each other. So start guide align these two, you get an alignment that looks like that, and the red and yellow, and you get an alignment that looks like that. 
and then you talk, take these alignments and align to each other. So basically, this is quite simple. This is something that we actually will talk, talk about later. So basically, instead of taking, you do it when you do a substitution matrix. No, 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 an alignment matrix like this, like this we did. And instead of having just one sequence here, you actually have two sequences. So then you can just calculate the same thing. You take these two, align these two spaces, you can just calculate if you do all, 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 all combinations, or these two, align these two. So you can just sum the scores of these things together. Okay, so what you can do is you actually prove what you can take on average of this. This is something we talk about in this slide. And, you can, you get, and then you can just get some score here and you get an alignment in exactly the <coughs> same dynamic program method as we do before. So that's, so basically in this case you start with, well you start with n squared si si single alignments, you get this, the distances. And then you need to do something like uh, n squared additional alignment of putting all, all things together. Of course, the problem here, is, as I said, is the gaps. So if you have, for instance, these four sequences aligned together and you want to add the fifth one, you have this w that's introduced. This is one the sequence is one longer. And here. But how do you count this gap? Is it an opening gap, an extension of gap? Or, so that's, how do you count that one? So you have to decide that. And the way that um, cluster W deals with this, so this is often you have a tendency when you do these things, is actually end up with a lot of small gaps. So I think that that's like, I mean, an alignment like this is, doesn't really make sense. It's like, you would like to have the gaps, well, maybe it makes sense, but you probably want to have as few gaps as possible because if you keep on doing this, you would have a, things that are very, very separate. You have like small pieces aligned and not a lot, 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 lot of gaps. And that's most likely not how evolution ha happens, so it's most likely not very good alignment. So what cluster W does is it actually have a gap opening penalty that is dependent on if there is a gap before. So this is a, has a function that you basically learn and optimize by during the development. And in that function you have a gap opening penalty that is normally 10 or something like that, or 8, 5 maybe. And then you see if you already have gaps, it drops much lower. It's a very conserved position, so like the K, KV here is very conserved, it's actually higher. And if there's a sequence of variation, it also gets lower. But in particular, it, that, that's the way you, you start, tend, you tend to put additional gaps where you already have gaps. Of course, then it's really important actually what you start with. If you start with something that is not very good, you're going to do not optimal alignment, you will keep on doing errors in the same place. But at least it will not make the alignment look like just a lot of gaps. In many cases. <coughs> so other methods do this similar, they have other they have similar ideas in the basis of ideas. So there's a lot of research to find this and it's st today it's really with the big big databases it's become a big problem. So really how how do you deal with ten thousand sequences? Partly time complexity and partly because it's actually it's not so that all methods get better when you add more information. So normally when you have a, uh, more data, you should do a better result. But uh, if you do, actually in some cases when you add more data to a multiple six alignment, you just get worse results, even for the, because just the methods are starting to use a lot of gaps and errors. It's not true for all methods, but there are some quite a lot of methods that do not manage to handle a lot of data. So, multiple sequence alignments. So, okay, let's, so now we have just some idea how to get it. We don't have to even get into detail with that. So that's, that's a bit of overwork, over course, extra. But what we, we, we should have an idea what we can get out, what information we can get out of it. And the first thing I can look at is, is like, how should it look like? So this is like, should, this should look pretty, that's the idea. No, but 
this is kind of informative because we have um, quite a lot of. Uh, this, this is supposed to be a good alignment. This is supposed to be a bad alignment. What you can see is that here there are some gaps in the left one here, but they are they are basically all in more or less the same place. And this is like evolution. You can imagine that there's a region, maybe a loop in the protein structure, that we can where it's quite easy to put in gaps. So it happens. What happened once and the gap become a bit longer and this keeps on being there. So there's of course one sequence that do not have a gap here, and then that well, that one actually happens to have a gap over here. So that may be better, but also here there are a few gaps. In this bad one, you see there are gaps in all different places, all over. Some are here, here, here. They're not really coordinated very much. So that's one uh, uh, one uh, observation. I think with too many gaps is kind of bad. Secondly, you can see that these have positions that are colored now by I think they call them amino acid type basically, not 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 uh, so type of amino acids that are like hydrophobic charts and that. So you have these kind of nice columns with a single color. So here you have a light scene, I guess it's K, a red column all the way up. And then you have something which has a little more variation. And then you have something which is basically mainly serine 3 and it's not so concerned. But before that, there's a lot of prolines, not only prolines, there's some vacancy also. So there are positions that are kind of conserved. So I indicate that for some functional reason, for, for the structure, for some other reason, that amino acid in that position is very important for this protein. And that's of course what you expect, because you expect if uh, an active site, an enzyme, or is the structure are important for the acid for fold or something, that is, that is conserved, or at least more or less conserved. Well, other, some other positions have more variation. And then this bad one, you see, so sure, there are some valence here, the isolation valent things that are conserved, but they're much less of this, and they kind of, even like, it seems like the two parts, or three parts here, you have like a top part, middle part, and bottom part that some are looking more similar to each other, and they look between each other. So maybe you should have divided it into three alignments or something like that. Or maybe you still think you could have shifted one in the right, other way or the other. So you can look at this conservation, so, and how for fractures is identical, and you see you know, there's only one region here, where this section have it in quite a lot of places. And you can get some consensus sequence, so basically if you take an average sequence position, and then score basically in conservation, you can get a sequence here, which is much more here it's much less hard to get the consensus because it's a much lower number share. So in, in general, a good alignment should look pretty, and too many dispersed gra gaps are something wrong with. Uh, so it's kind of, I mean, it happens. I mean, I, I've seen alignments with, for proteins that are a few hundred residues long, that are 10,000 re residues long in the alignment because they have gaps all over. So basically you have one position here, and then you have a gap, and you have one position 100 residues later. Cause that, and that happens if you, if you do things with, with with many, many sequences. So, so what can you learn from this multiple sequence alignment? So what can you learn here is hard to learn from just two, one sequence, two sequences. Any ideas? Well, so what do you think this is? So this is position with all the gaps. So where do you think gaps happen? We haven't talked so much about protein structure yet, but I guess some of your biochemists, you know, something about protein structure. So, of course, in, you can imagine the so protein structure consists of mainly alpha helices, beta sheets, and loops, so three types of secondary structures. And uh, it's so basically you have the secondary structures that are packed together, and you have the loop in between, between them. And, if, and it's quite clear that secondary structures, loops, are much more common, gaps are much more common in loops than they are in the secondary structure elements. They can exist in secondary structure elements also, it's not that they happen at particular the ends of them, but, but also in the middle. But in general, if you see something like this, this is a clear indication that this is a loop region. So, and especially, it's often on the surface of the protein. If it's the internal side of the protein, it's also hard to make. Even if it loops it's internal, it's hard to make it, make it longer or shorter because you're going to disturb it after it. So it's also the surface area. So it's most, most mainly exposed loops even. Particularly, this one have had large variation in length. Uh, you, can, you can also look, so beta turn loops, if you see a conserved glycine proline, 
the problem there and I get the glycine, you can't really see, but this is glycine. So if you have, even though glycine is a problem, very specific, they make tight, they need to make a tight touch. So just yes, thing, I mean, it doesn't mean that if you have single glycine somewhere or single pro, pro, pro line somewhere, that it is always a turn, but if this in the whole family, basically every single sequence has a glycine here, or most of them have it, that's a good indication that this is a bit of turn. Uh, if you look at this, you can see that this is every second residue is, is uh, hydrophobic <coughs> and every second residue is uh, hydrophilic, more or less. So you have valine, threonine, isolution, threonine, valine, glutamate, alanine, proline. So you have like a hydrophobic pattern. This pattern is every second residue. You know, like we had a beta sheet and then we have a 180 degrees turn. So Every second residue is pointing one way, and every second residue, the other second residue is pointing the other way. And so that means that this is one of the sides is going to be hydrophobic, and one of the sides is going to be hydrophilic. So that would indicate that this is a beta sheet that's on the surface of the protein, one, fa one area facing inwards and one facing outwards. Yes. There's just a higher probability that it's a better strand. Don't have to be. That it doesn't have to be. It, can, it could be something else. But well, in this case. Pro the prediction, it, prediction will be quite good, yeah, but yeah. Is it also possible that there is just one sequence um, by random in this alignment so that it's a completely different shape than the other ones? Be because sometimes, I mean, yeah. Yes, yeah, so I mean, of course, I mean. I mean, it has changed sometimes the whole uh, structure. So, so we, we come to something we talked about in more the sequence structure relationship. So, so certainly. In an alignment, you can have mistakes. Certainly, you can, by mistake, you find something that doesn't fit at all. Often, that makes the alignment look ugly. So often, that they say, but excluding that, when there are things that are not, uh, when there are no mistakes, the things that should be deleted. In most cases, this would indicate that I think I would say that the structure is the same. So basically, if you have sequences that are disconserved, the structures are very similar. There are cases with exceptions, but they are quite rare. There, there, there is. One example, you have a single point mutation towards one point of an alpha helical beta sheet. Completely. But that, that's, it's basically proven that you have dual stabilities, and it's a very, very rare case. So like there, there are exceptions like that, but extremely rare. And patterns like this are extremely strong. So this is a very, very good indication that this is a beta sheet. I mean, it's, it's, so so there are, we talk about it, actually, we start talking about it in the afternoon, but more later in the week, we talk about methods for predicting secondary structure. And of course, these methods, what they do is exactly they take out this patterns and learn and recognize it and uh, sure it's a prediction nothing is p perfect but they are uh, I mean they are up to 80% correct and uh, for the, the parts where they have this type of signals they are 95% correct most of errors you make is exactly where does it start where does it end I mean is this a part of it or this is it's, I mean, that's that that's kind of this part in the middle is a bit of strand is extremely unlikely it shouldn't be and if you have one sequence that's wrong, I mean, not related to what matter, but if also if you have, the problem is if you start having one sequence wrong and you start, the alignment can screw up and everything looks just bad and you get nothing out of it. So th this is one thing that you, you can try to say is that you can actually look at this by eye, but also we can later, I'll talk about it a little bit today, but more about it, on, I think, on Thursday, use these kind of multiple sequence alignments to have a computer to learn these patterns. And they're much better than we are. And they're, they're experts that are very good at looking at like, the hand. And it's just that it takes some time. Uh, this is also again, a kind of a bit strange alignment. But this is, you see here, there are some loops here. This is, you, see, you can really see up the eye that you have two parts, two different subfamilies. There's one family down here and one family up here, because this one has much more gaps here. Uh, what this one seems to be some kind of intermediate, you know. So they're, they're probably, and this part is quite conserved, but you have four or five strands here that are losing, losing, veiling, veiling, nice solution. That indicates that it's a buried beta strand. So it's a beta strand that's completely buried. You also, you also know that veiling, for instance, are, um, and I mean, acids is very much prefer to be in beta sheet than the beta strand than alpha helices because of the brand side chain, it doesn't really fit in the helix. So there are uh, patterns here, you can see. But as you see, it's a little bit of variation. If you go on one sequence, you want to take it, but it's conserved. 
Because it, there's some variation, there's some charge attributes here and there's some phases. There are positive and negative charge different ones and there are. Uh, and this is a glycine. Yeah, there's some variation, but in the middle it's conserved hydrophobic. So that would indicate that the beta strand is buried. So if you ha instead have a pattern which is it's like three or four, so you have like hydrophobic, hydrophobic, hydrophilic, hydrophilic, or something, or like I think if you have pattern seven, because you know in, in that, that would indicate alpha helix. Because alpha helix has three point six, so three and a half amino acids per turn. And if that's a, if that is in a, a surface, so one part is facing the the water and one part is facing the inside of the protein, you would have a repetitive pattern of seven, something or three and a half. So you have one, two, three, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three. Four. So that would indicate that it's uh, amphipathic alpha helix. So cysteine is always a very specific amino acid. Uh, where do I have the cysteine there? Yeah, it should be cysteine somewhere. Uh, and I mean, conserved cysteines are often dice alpha bonds. That's what in case of these two. We have two conservative systems, so you can bind to each other. Yes? Will we be looking at anything at membrane protein synthesis as well, or only at solid proteins? I don't remember what you do in the lab, but, but in the membrane proteins, you would see, uh, of course, you would see a very, so the membrane protein would be very easy to recognize. You would see very, very long, like 20 amino acids of conserved hydrophobic residues. So that's quite easy to recognize. I don't, well, we have, we're going to have a lecture about it, but I don't think. I don't, I don't think we have any of the examples in the multiple sequence element directly, but they, they is to recognize this in this way, but, but I think we'll not to specifically look at the multiple sequence element view. I don't know where this concern is just in this, maybe it's so small, somewhere should be. Yeah, I read it, this is the system, yeah. And I guess there's another one somewhere else there. So we indicate that this position and this position should be a hybridized half of between them. And this alignment is so, sort of okay, but it's not, you see there are a couple, I mean, a couple of sequences that are a lot of gaps, so it's not, it's not, conservation is kind of random every second uh, position. Yes? When working uh, with alignment cycles and you find two systems, do you also draw conclusions on their location in the cell? Think like, oh, maybe this is the protein uh, uh, stuck in the, uh, between the mitochondrial membranes or, uh, I don't know. I mean, normally the cysteine so would, would be intracellular because it doesn't happen outside the cell. Uh, and so certainly you can learn things like that. If it, but but if that's uh, nowadays I guess there are better indications for the location of cells. But traditionally, of course, you, you, you can maybe learn like that. I mean, like more in the way of thinking when you're working yeah. with it. Yeah, when you work, you try to basically take all the evidence you have, I mean, whatever questions you have. Nowadays, of course, we have basically what you do. I mean, you have most likely, if you have multiple six cell alignment, like that's, there, there are a couple of big families that are unknown. But you really, there, there are, I mean, you have no idea what it does. And they are quite, you most likely can find some distant homologies or something like that and have some indication of what it does. Or you can try to find this uh, string database, look at things with, with, that have indication where, it, where it's located. If you look at the cells, that have the signals in the cell. We have the signal peptides, basically, and other peptides that uh, other signals that tells you where in the cell it can be. So you can run predictions on that. Uh, I think I'll talk a bit about it in the afternoon, a little bit, by the example. So, so there are, you can do many more things. But and, and really looking at multiple six alignments is it's, uh, it's it's useful when you do it. But it's the problem now is it's just getting so big. So really, uh, the, so most what at least I do for it is to use for looking at evolution. Really, what happened in evolution. So not really for predicting things. So they're, they're basically, the computers are better at than you are. So, like, you, so basically, if you, want to have, if you want to figure out what it does, you run a computer program. I mean, if you want a secondary structure, you, instead of trying to figure it out yourself, you run a computer program that does it for you. Yeah, because unless you're a super expert, they are better than you. <laughs> and now there are a few of these left. So, and, but the important thing when you look at this, actually, is, is to color it. So it's actually... And this is what you have. You, what you have is often that you have a coloring scheme. You can have in your JAL view, is probably the most popular multiple six alignment viewer, 
that they can call it. They can call it by half the pole, you say something, it's called by barred index, but it's it's related, so I like it to be barred. You can call, call it by some probability to be helix, so you can see or beta strands. This is also amino acids that prefer to be that you can see which is the patterns. And you can call it by conservation, for instance. That is an important uh, or amino acid types, you can see things like that. So really, and then also you have different ways to call it. You just click there. I want to call it by conservation. I want to call it by other ways. So here, we you call it, I mean, this is called by some amino acid types. And you see this glass is quite clear. You see the, but I think this is only con colors to conserved positions, basically. See the, the ones that are not very conserved has you know, basically white. You want to call it conserved ones. So. So here you have some coloring by conservation, so you can see basically what the position of conserved, I guess it's white is most, well, maybe, and the bottom ones are by properties. So you can see, so a combination of these two is actually quite useful, because you can see if you find some conserved as you see here, and this is a bag in here, that you can color, check what properties have there. So combination of conservation and properties is kind of important. If we only, only look at this, of course, it's hard to see what is, when you see this piece here that are very conserved stands out, but they are, but it's also it's hard to see other things otherwise. So playing around with the coloring is kind of if you want to look at things that are kind of important. And as you see, these are kind of good alignments because basically there are no gaps at all. I don't see the gaps. And um, okay, so how can you, how can we if we want the computer to use these multiple signals and elements. And this is really probably, I mean, there are two ways. Uh, basically, we can tra train the computer to look at this directly. So we like recognize patterns here. So the typical example I'll talk about la later is secondary structure prediction. So if you can see these patterns for secondary structure prediction, you can let the computer learn it, and they are much better doing it than we are. And they can do it about close to 80% correct on average. But we can also use it for finding more homologs. And this is uh, using something called PSSMs or profiles or uh, hidden marker models. They are re all related. They are basically the same idea. Mathematically, they are s our profiles and PSSMs are basically the same thing. It's just different words. And hidden marker models is just mathematically a more elegant way to do it. Uh, so. Well, it's not always true, but it's basically so profiles and PSSM are related. It's basically sometimes it depends on how much if you use gap information or substitution tables. So it's a bit detail how you make them. But the idea is basically as we had over here is that if you take this, if you make a proof a multiple sequence alignment, some way you make it as we have here. And then I take one al sequence I want to align against this multiple sequence alignment. So basically, when we, this, when we want to do this cluster W, I can, if I just put the size here, I can, okay, what is the cost to align in G to this column, which is triple A? And what is the cost to align in G to a column of GCC? So I can again say, take, I mean, easy way to take the substitution matrix score of G to A, and G to A, and G to A, and G to C. D and E to C and E to C. So let's take these three numbers together. So I can basically, so I can basically replace this in this case by saying that this is 100% A, this is 100% C, this is 66%, this is 67% C, 33% G, etc. So I can just take the, average, I mean the fraction of each amino acid or nucleotide in each position and then use that as a score. So basically, that means if this position here, which is completely random, basically I get a score of zero, because it doesn't matter what I line to it. But if this position is very conserved, I get the same substitution score as I do for a single amino acid. And then I can use standard dynamic programming. So I can do take a sequence here, I'm going to turn it around for my get a profile here. I can use standard, exactly the same dynamic programming. I have to decide how to deal with gap pens and set the same that, and there are different uh, ways to do that. But then basically, uh, that's that's the detail. 
So you get how you that is works the same way as we did when you do Smith Waterman or the, we did normal dynamic programming alignments. It's just that we have different scores basically. It's the same matrix with different scores. Mm -hmm. Well I uh, will just go through one of these methods a little bit how you do this. And uh, that's something that was in introduced in a uh, long time ago, 87, by Gripskov, Matlach and Eisenberg. And uh, that is, uh, well, it doesn't really have a probabilistic model. Later methods have a much better probabilistic model, a better model than this. Uh, basically, but it has a bit more heuristic method. But it works quite well. So basically, the score for each position is set to the average of the standard substitution score from all the rest in the corresponding multiple six alignment column. So basically, so align one of mean as here to this profile is just to take in this one to every single member there, or to the average I mean, the fraction you have of each I mean, as type there. So the so basically, you score each as average score for the rest with all sequence in the multiple six elements, and your score all, all replacement. So basically. If you want to calculate the score for rest to A in column, column I, so in this column here, and this column has so V, 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 F, I. So I have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 Vs, 1 F, 1 I. So that's just 5 sevenths of the score of substitution V to A, 1 sevenths of F to A, 1 sevenths of I to A. Yes. Sum this together. So I can describe this guy is just the average score of my my test seek I mean acid here with all the other ones here. And the S is here just it's just the standard substitution matrix of PAM two fifty or gap loss of sixty two or something like that. So let's go small through a example here. So have, if you have you know the example here, so if fifty percent I solution 30% 3 and 2 percent valence, you have 10 amino acids maybe, 5 i, 3, 3 and 2 valence, and you will calculate the score for i solution in this position, and you use pet of 50 matrix, and you go look at your matrix, you have i minus i equals i to i is 5, i to t is 0, i to v is 4 in scores. So the score is 0.5 times 5 plus 0.3 times 0 plus 0.2 times 4 equals 3.3. So that's an easy. And actually, then for some reason, they over the state to make it integral with three, but that's because it was faster to calculate in 87. Because floating points were slow. They also use some kind of specific gap tenders. So if you, have, if you have gaps in one position here, you can say you have a lower gap uh, extension cost, but that was kind of uh, just a heuristic equation they used, so no, no really, really problem there. So there are some problems with this. So there are basically problems. Basically, if I, we, if the sentence is very conserved, we will really give it a high, high score because we know it's very important. We won't do want to put anything else there. But if it's just one sequence, if, it's, if you have, in this case, if you have basically something that looks like the A aligned to two gaps or A aligned like that, you get the same score. And you would say uh, this should be good score, this can be whatever, it doesn't really matter. So that's how I would uh, like to count that. Uh, and particularly if you big, make bigger, bigger sequences, you should do that. Well, as I say, we have the same pro problem here with gaps. You have uh, scores for deletion, column 2 would be would, so column 2. And three, four will be the same value. So see here, if you want to start another gap here, and here it's not. Would this gap here is just actually making one gap, although it's like in five different sequences. But here you would only make gap in one sequence, and uh, uh, to make another gap here would be high. More like be another gap here would make it higher. I think we have it in the we had before. Well, uh, let's, uh, there are other arguments also. You can skip this actually. So after the break, so, so now, the, the, now people play around with it. You can you can score it different ways, and, and the conclusion is that it actually works much better. 
than using a sequence alignment. But it wasn't really very useful because it was time consuming to do this. I mean, there was a part of the program you could use it, but it was not very much used until 1997, basically, when people introduced the Cyblast. So this is a paper so just position specific iterative blast. It's a part of the standard blast package. And it's really useful because it really can do basically all these things, completely automatic, with a good with a good quality. And one reason of this is because the good statistical methods that had the common blast too. So this statistical significance is very important. Out. And other things also because blast is very fast. So you can actually do this uh, many times in a reasonable amount of time. So this is really one of the big breakthroughs in bioinformatics, I would say. And probably this paper has been cited something like 100,000 times or 10,000 times at least. So, okay. Coffee break. I will try to explain Cyblast. So as I said, this is from 97, and it's, uh, I mean, it was quite a real breakthrough. In particular, it, it is quite fast. It basically takes the same time as Blast, but you run it a few times more, so like maybe three or five or ten times longer than Blast. Uh, so it's actually, for a big database, it's much faster than running dynamic programming. But it's also way much more accurate. In the, particularly in its ability to detect distantly related proteins. So it's basically one of the proteins. But, uh, so the start, you basically start with a single sequence. And in the first round, you just run BLAST. But then you make a multiple, multiple alignment, we'll talk a bit more about it in a second. And a profile, so basically, uh, basically describing the frequency of each amino acid in each position. And then you use this profile to compare it against the proton database again. You also you always do local alignments. And in, in each step here, you actually evaluate the statistical significance of all the alignments. Each. You only include the ones that are like very likely to be correct. And then you iterate here several times. Normally not more than 10, but maybe 3 or 5 or 10. Well, either, uh, either until you don't find any more sequences, which actually hardly nowadays never ever happens, but at least it's uh, uh, possible to do that like that. So in a summary, it looks like that. You have your database of proteins, sequences. You start with an input sequence and do a blast. You filter all the results using some kind of e value threshold. So you say anything that is normally just 10 to minus 3. I think, I think 5 times 10 to minus 3 is default. So like it's only one in a thousand times you should get a false hit. You make a multiple sequence alignment. Actually, this is not really much of a multiple sequence alignment. It's just basically an iterative alignment to whatever the sequence you start with, but that's okay. You make a profile or a position specific score matrix that looks like that. And then you use this to search again. So in this way here, so you have a profile here, and this is your sequence database, and you search again. And because this is much more sensitive, you'll find more sequences. This has more information in it. Uh, so what's good about it? It's fast. Still, it's like I mean, 40 times. It depends on the size of the database. Much faster than dynamic programming. Today, you wouldn't do dynamic programming on a sequence database. It would just take forever. It's significant better than you get much better in the sense of detecting good more distant homologs. So you find the, the distance relationship is often what mean better. Then it's better. And maybe, and you still have good evil estimates. It's perhaps slightly higher risk that you get a high score in false positives if you just, just run blast. Particularly if you use, if you run it many times, many iterations. Sometimes you don't get optimal alignments because you always do local alignments all the time. So if you could be better on global alignments in the beginning, you can get better alignments. So basically, you have 
two or maybe three input options. You have cut off the value and number iterations. So basically, this means how many sequences, well not how many, but how many sequences until what probability to be random do I include? So I think the fourth is five times ten to minus three and number iterations you can run well, you, you rarely run more than 10, because it's really, this is somebody that you start getting something wrong in there, and you, yeah, m that kind of has tendency to multiply. Often you want to do low complexity filtering, as we said before, so that you can take away. All right, this is basically the same thing again. So let's try. No, no, let's see. I guess I have to do like this. So let's go to the NC by Blast, as we used the other day, yeah? Ah, I don't have a network. Oh, this still takes a few seconds, because this is, for some reason, this network is very slow. Uh, but um, in the meantime, I can maybe copy-paste this. So I was just going to take one sequence here that I and I run against Swiss plot. I guess Swiss plot because it's much faster than running against NC and DNR. So hopefully we can get this uh, to work. The networks here are really really slow to connect to. That's right, I can keep on talking a bit in in the meantime. So as the repeat again, so you take a sequence, just blast, search a protein, and you you can think of one thing it does is that it actually when you do the multiple sequence alignment, it actually doesn't really do a multiple sequence alignment. In a way, because in multiple sequence alignment you want to be able to introduce gaps in every sequence. What blast side blast does is that it actually have you create a sequence here, and then it just takes if sequences is fine, sequence one, sequence two, etc. And if, if there's a gap here, it seems to use a gap. But if this one is longer, so you want to have an extra G here, for instance, so you should have a gap over there, it just ignores that. So it skips this one. So you, so you always have a profile of exactly the same length as you create a sequence. And if you remember our blast. Uh, um, hits. We, when we search on that is, we used to have get a few hits that were long like that, and then we had often maybe some shorter hits also. So of course, often you have like one region where you have more information than you have in other regions. Oh. This is horrible, this uh, network, yeah? I'm going to need to start it, I see. No. Not this. Well, maybe we have to skip it. So I can add connect to the net. Let's see if we come back to it later. So, uh, 
So the idea, the idea is basically that in the first iteration you find out of this, and then in the second iteration you maybe find it more this. But the idea is that the this alignment will be longer and longer. So you will find more and more, and then you will find more and more. That's exactly, exactly what you find if you manage to get the connection to the network, which I can't. Okay. So now I was going to switch to another related topic, which is something called hidden Markov models. So you, who know, you have some physicist, do you know what the Markov chain is? No. Yeah. <laughs> the presentation. No, I'm sorry. Okay, the presentation. Okay. So who knows what the Markov chain is? Yeah, it's a uh, chain of events for each uh, <coughs> current condition. Uh, exactly. So, so the, the history. Yeah, exactly. It's already. So you, only, you are in one position, or I mean, your computer model or whatever model you have. And then you can only. Uh, it doesn't matter how you got there. It's, uh, something can happen. You can go to the right or the left, and it matters only what you, what you what you have done before. Uh, ah, next, now I'm connected. So now I can. So, so before I talk about model chains, I can run my example. Maybe. This claims are connected. Yes. So. I can do a proton blast there. So this is the same as I did yesterday. And I'll test and I think uh, I need to I need to go back to this one. So so here this is exactly the same thing as we did yesterday. I want to run Cyblast instead, so I click there and I want to run the Swiss spot. Uh, there. And then run it. So this is quite fast. If I, if I run it in NR, I mean, I find more sequences than I, I, I <coughs> take longer. So in the meantime, you can think about what marker models can have, to, marker chains can have to do with proton sequences. Because the key is that you can think about it as an alignment. Well, you can actually use it in many, many cases. For you, you, you can think. Uh, so I found something, it's still searching. So this is something here, so here it actually finds one hit that shows you there that for a small database of, of families. So it has a helix, turn helix, x or e super family, something. But uh, now it will take some time before it finds it. Ah, it takes a minute or two. Maybe it's a popular time to run now, so it's slower. I don't know. So the, the first run I run here, I guess, is just a single iteration. Well, it takes longer than I thought, but uh, it shouldn't take that long. As you see, even here it has some information. It, can be, it, can be, it has a non specific DNA binding site, the salt bridge, particularly there, and the Sika specific DNA binding site there. So this is information from these superfamilies. This is a small database of superfamilies and researchers. But now it takes forever. Okay, so while this is running, I can uh, maybe keep on talking about the market models. So a marker chain, as I said, is something that doesn't matter where we come from. So a classical example is the weather prediction. So if you think about that there's three states, you have sunny, rain, or cloudy. So this is the weather. It's not Sweden, but some of snowy and hail and things like that also, but in somewhere in California, I guess, it's going to be sunny, rain, or cloudy. And the probability is what you want to predict what is the weather going to be tomorrow. And all you care about is what is the weather today. Of course, if it's California, it will be sunny, 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 but um, this is somewhere else. 
But it, it's actually, if you're sunny in this place, it's 50% chance to be sunny tomorrow. So you, you, if you're always sunny, you have 50% chance to go to sun again, and 25% chance to go to uh, rain, and 25% to go to cloudy. So if it's cloudy, you have uh, 37% chance to go to sunny, and 37% chance to go to rain. So it's, not, it's unlikely to be cloudy two days in a row. It goes one way or another. So, so this is a, if you just have an observation, so this is your state, and you have an observation of a long chain of events, you can calculate these probabilities. Yes? Yesterday was cloudy, and today is one. Yeah, but this, okay, if this is yesterday, so this should sum up to one. Yeah, sum up to one horizontally, but it doesn't do this. So this is one, this is, this is not one, you're right. And when is also not one. Yeah, it's not one, you're right. So, yeah, you're right. Okay, so something's wrong with the numbers, correct? So, someone didn't do the math correctly. Uh, but if this is kind of given a chain like that, you could think, if you think about the sequence, so what is the probability you have an alanine followed by a tryptophan? If you take all the sequences, they are not, they are quite close to being random, but not, not really random, certainly. Uh, so this is something that is actually used, these kind of models are, uh, and you can start, I mean, the distribution start here and you can calculate what is the probability that we're going to have rain in five days. You start with one here, you start with Sunday, and then you calculate some of all probabilities. And then quite good algorithms to find this. Okay. And the next time is actually hit the mark models, which we will talk about the next case. But maybe this has fi finished running, it has not. So and then I we give up this. And then they're running a super family. This book, yes I did. I don't know why it takes so long. Okay, so let's talk about hidden Markov models. So in the hidden Markov model, as the name states, you have a hidden state. Uh, so this is actually probably how the, how the weather was, but this is what you observe. You can't say if it's uh, soggy, damp, dryish, or dry. You can observe the sun, cloud, the rain. But so you. Uh, um, Or actually, maybe the other way around. So this is going to observe, and this is what you. This is going to observe, and this is the hidden state. So the weather is like that, but you can't really observe it directly because maybe I don't, you don't have. Well, I don't know why you can't <laughs> couldn't observe it, but you can maybe have just a measure of dryness. And um, so then, you, then you. So basically, you, you can then calculate if you know something about this. You can you would say if it's sunny, it has certain percentage risk chance of being dry and certain risk of being soggy. It's rainy, the risk of being soggy is high and the risk of being dry is smaller, but it does have to be zero and one, so it's not direct observation. But you can basically think that these, these states emit one of these states with a certain probability. So then, of course, if you have observation of these states, so along the line of this, you can try to estimate all these, these transitions here between these states, but also these uh, emission probabilities. So this is mathematically not super easy to do it, but you can do it. And maybe not exact, but you can estimate them and you can do algorithms to do it. And this is something you can actually think about as you get an alignment in this way, because you basically can think this is sequences you observe and you have some relationship behind them that are describing something biological. But that's um, So here you can have some kind of you can you can get observation here that you can try to back calculate from your observed data, and this seems to add up to one at least if I do it roughly. So if the weather is sunny, you have six percent chance to be dry. If it's cloudy, it's equally or if it's rainy, it's fifty percent chance to be soggy. And then you can try to estimate that as well as these erroneous probabilities, and you try to make an obs. Mm, Model for how are these gonna 
or is forbidden to find these sometime in the future. So you can actually think about this as uh, this one as something that generates secrets. You have here you can think of this is a put of family. And this is the sequence I can generate. So I can generate this. Well, how is, and then I can ask the question, how likely is it that this sequence I observe is generated by this family, for instance? And this I can do by actually making a model like this. So this is a very short model of a so-called proof of the hidden marker model. So in each position here, you have a match state. So that means that in a state where you emit, uh, and I mean, uh, amino acid, just sort of pretty sort of pretty different uh, uh, alanine or tryptophan. And from that one you can go to another math state, you can go to an insert state that also has probability to emit amino an amino acid. So that means that you can do uh, uh, but that is from a background distribution normally. Or you can do a jump up to the delete state to do the meter and skip some amino acid and you can jump down there. So if you have such a model, so if a model looks like that, so if you have a model like this, that basically tries to meet things, maybe I will probably meet something. this. Then you can say, okay, I meet uh, some amino acids here. And maybe I jump up into gap states here and then can make a gap here. So basically then I ask I can then ask the question what is probably here I have a sequence, this is my observable states. What is probably that this model generates the sequence? I can compare it to a random sequence, I can compare it to another sequence, etc. etc. That. So if I can generate such a model that you have here for a protein family, for a multiple sequence alignment, basically, which I somehow, this is more or less one co column in a multiple sequence alignment, if I can generate a model for that, with all the probabilities and everything like that, I can actually ask a question, how likely is it that a certain sequence belongs to this, multi this family, this multiple sequence alignment? So, I, and in this way, I, so basically I need to train, so this is basically how common is after one, I mean, acid in one position. And this, this probability between young and between states is basically how likely is it that I have a gap in this position? How many gaps have I observed before? Is it, is it, is it, so that way you can have a very specific gap extension penalty. So you can have a, it could be very likely to have a gap here, jump here, but from this one to this one it can be very unlikely because it's never observed. So this is so-called proof of hidden model. models. Hidden model models are used other ways in biology also. When they started from speech recognition, so they used in many other fields also. But uh, Gunnar will certainly talk about it next week when he talks about um, uh, membrane proteins. So, what was this one? This well, it's just the different probabilities how you can jump between different things. You need to estimate all the things. And they, they, this, they are quite good algorithms for estimating this. Basically, you use dynamic programming in one way or another to calculate it and you look at your statistics. But you need to use some, some heuristics also. So in, in one math stage, you have probably look at like that. You never put everything to zero. You have a small background, but basically this is a position where proline is very, very conserved. So then you have a, have a probability to have proline in this position is very, very high. While in the second stage, you have much more equal distribution. You have some preference to be an alanine, but it can basically be a number of different amino acids. In the third position, you can have something like that. So there's a three anine, but also serine is allowed, etc. The fourth position, like that. Like that. So you can also have a, sto you, you, you can play around with it. You can think things if you allow states to jump from can start from here, instead of starting to state one, you can start, start wherever it wants, you make a local alignment. So basically you have a local alignment, just you can jump into wherever you want, and then you need some state here in the beginning that generates some background sequences somehow. Some silent states. 
for other parts of actually, let's this one. Mm. So let's see if this one works. Oh, oh yeah. I don't know what happened here. There are actually a number of different algorithms that are all based on dynamic programming, but there are, so there are, but there are variations of that thing, you know. And some of them are called, uh, uh, I mean, you, you, you can, for instance, if you have a sequence here, because what is the most, I mean, this sequence can be generated in many different ways. You can think about getting an A here, but you can also generate an A here. So sometimes you want to ask, what is the probability that this, any of all these together, has generate uh, this sequence. That's, that's called the forward-backward algorithm. But you also say, okay, which is the most likely way that it's generated? That's called the Viterbi algorithm. So you can ask all these questions, and they're just uh, variations of uh, dynamic programming. So how do you get to see the Markov model? So basically, this is, well, if you have it once, it's somehow understandable how you can get the sequence. I mean, you can basic, basically think, well, okay, if I want to find, I have to find an optimal path through this, it's basically dynamic programming. So, uh, a key thing here is actually, often, often, you, just, often you, you can start using underlying sequences. So it's a bit like a uh, side blast, that you actually start one sequence, a few sequences, and you start with some uh, uh, rough estimates, you start some rough ideas how, how to align them together, and then you just then yes, align more and more sequences to it, just as you do in side blast, and you say, okay, this sequence is aligned here, but in this case you know which one you should align probably, which is much slower. And then you build uh, see how they align to this algorithm and then you you make a new model later. So in general this is uh, very So in general, you see the market models are has some advantage over the classical profile, particularly the way that you can deal with the gaps. So you can really have specific gaps in different positions. Every position can have specific gaps. It's uh, well, in principle, you can look at it afterwards and you can view it and interpret it as you want. It's actually very effective to take the homologs. It's quite slow. It um, there's an Particular version called Hammer 3, which is much, much faster nowadays than the old ones. It's actually not that slow anymore. And there are versions that are roughly as fast as Psyblast, because they have some heuristic, uh, heuristics. Uh, sometimes you find, I mean, the training process is not really obvious what to do in the best possible way. So let's see if this has finished. Yes, but maybe I can. So this is blast, it worked fine, I don't know why the side blast was long. Uh, so if I can uh, pick these, can I make an can I use this see if I can do this? So let's take this uh, good score once. So can if I use ten to minus three as cut off, I would use only D3. I wonder if I can do something if I can run this side blast. Uh, Select alignments, download, the multiple alignment. I don't understand why this looks. Let's see if this works. OK. 
Precis som som alltid sticker som använder det för att jag gör just någonting som jag kallar kobalt. But I cannot do anything more with that. Uh, no. I want it around this, but it's forever. Um, this one, so this was uh, 5.14, so maybe this one is done. Yeah, so here I got. I don't know, I have no idea why, why it took such a long time, but... Um, so this was the first run I started. So you see, this is the end thing at the side blast. I find these three hits here that are... Uh, Significant. And I found four hits because the cutoff is five times ten to minus three. So I find four hits that are be above my cutoff. So I can select all these, and you see the names of these are repressor protein C1, repressor protein C1. They probably all, all are all related to my starting protein. And, uh, and then I have a lot of hits which are below my e-value thresh threshold. So it's just on the border, but. Uh, this one is actually probably better because it's longer, but that was not similar enough. And, uh, and then I can run the second iteration. Hopefully it doesn't take 10 minutes this time also. So now I take these four sequences. Cyplus makes a multiple sequence alignment of it. I mean, this kind of creative based alignment and does another search. And hopefully I will find more sequences. It looks down as fast as I don't know what happened. So you see here, uh, if you look at the scores here, you have more of these ones. I have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven alignments look very good here in the beginning. If you look at I have all these one, two, three, four, five new hits that I was not found below the cutoff before. These E values are quite good, it's ten to minus five, ten to minus six. And this one if you I guess it was this last one, before I had an E value of ten to minus three, remember? And now it's ten to minus fourteen. So it's much more significant. So I can, uh, can I get, no, no. Uh, I can pick all these. So and you see, so I found, and you see, see all the proteins. Now, now the proteins are not called repressor protein C language. They're called uncharacterized HDA type proteins. So that's probably something which is, well, it's probably is a related to it, but it's maybe not the same type of protein as the other one, exactly. So I can take these proteins and run one more iteration. Hopefully, that's also fast. This one I get close, and this one was well, this one was not fast. No, no, no. See, there are more green things here, actually I have fewer uh, li uh, pink. And I found, you see, I found another, see, even this one that was lost one before has low uh, E values, this one's about the same E value. But you see, I found things that are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 more proteins, and they're all uncharacterized H to H type, H to H, they are, it's not the repressor C1 in some other bacteriophage. So you see that I find, I mean, each iteration I find more and more. So after you can run this up to ten iterations, <coughs> there's a certain risk that if I would, if I would, for instance, if I would include some of these, well, some of from the down here, and maybe I'll take just a few of these in the beginning, I would probably get a bad alignment, and then probably get something that would not work very well. I probably would find fewer things. So if you there's a risk if you, if you include something that's completely wrong, well, I mean, it could be that you actually get the worst performance. You see, oh, this was just a try. I don't know if it works. We'll see what happens. But um, I will. Uh,
طرف فنشت I found a lot of, found a lot of things and I'm not sure if these are really I don't remember correct all of them I don't know. It's, uh, but most of it was correct it probably didn't happen much there's actually one new thing that you could uh, uh, in blast is probably going delta blast which is a really good thing because it's extremely fast so that, and it's actually good at finding things also and delta blast the idea is there basically so you start searching for a very very small database of prudent families. And if you find a hit there, you make a profile that's already pre made. So th this uh, should be fast, I hope. And it's something that released just a couple of years ago, and it's actually quite effective. So here you saw, so actually, if you, well, I don't know, you don't see it, but if you, here you have. Uh, some proteins to find. So basically, you search this family database, like it's not PFAM, but it's related to PFAM. No, I guess I find something. So in the first round, one thing you can see is I find many things that are actually much longer here. They don't have super high scores, but if you look at the E values, they are. In the first round, you see I found a lot of sequences. As mentioned, it was with Cyblast, but in just one round of searching. So th this is really an efficient uh, way of, uh, in one iteration, you, you just guess you can go keep on going on to the next iteration there also, can you? Uh, yes. So I, can, I can pick out this and on another Cyblast iteration with this again. So the idea is basically what I do is I search a pre-made database of profiles, so, so also, or other families, and of course most students they have some hit there. It means that I can make, make a profile of this very very fast because I'm going to take this profile and I use this to search again. So it's like a, we're kickstarting Cyblast. I guess that's the thing. Oops. Oh, I just went over. That's the paper. So, so there was something called CS Blast that was very good. Uh, so that, is, that was actually introduced into this kind of uh, uh, It combines information from certain CS database with information derived from a library of short put the profile so she better hold it to the side boss. Um, it's such a database of pre-constructed profiles, PSSMs, before searching a protein single database. Uh, and then it uses something, a database called Conserved Domain Database, CDD. And then it says that in, on test space, blah, 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 it's thus, this much better than that one. So it's uh, so basically the, this is just a trick. Like you, you start using the uh, pre-processed database that's smaller, and then this way you can do searching much faster. So, so, so I, like in one search for that, I could get all the hits I wanted after five or ten iterations of side blast. And if I would use generic programming, it would have taken hours or days even. Okay. So, any questions? You will learn more about these hidden market models in, in these presentations next week. So, some people that hadn't... Uh, uh,